Shalom and welcome to yet another episode of TV7 Editor's Note. I'm Jonathan Hassan, of course, and uh, today we have a very special group with us, uh, led by our dear friend here, Dr. Rafael Bardahi, who was here also last week and uh, has now come, uh, as we communicated, of course, about this trip. Um, so far, so good? Yeah, excellent. Thank you. I'm glad for having me. Uh, it's truly a pleasure, as always. And uh, just uh, so our uh, viewers, before we start, of course, our uh, regular episodes with prayer, uh, I'll introduce each and every one. So we have, of course, Dr. Rafael Barraji, who is uh, Spain's former national security advisor and CEO of Worldwide Strategy. We have Brigadier General Yossi Kupelwasser, who you all know, of course, from Jerusalem Studio, who has been uh, with us for many, many years, uh, who was the head of uh, research and assessment in the IDF's uh, intelligence directorate and uh, currently the Middle East uh, Developments Project uh, uh, director at the Jerusalem Center for Public um, affairs, if I'm not mistaken. No. And of course, also Timo Soini, uh, the former foreign minister of Finland, who has been part of our Europa Stands uh, programs uh, many times, and uh, God willing, also in uh, just uh, a week from uh, yeah, today, yeah. you will we join will. us in the studio. Yeah, in Helsinki, yeah. Correct. Welcome. Well, <laughs> we're looking forward to it. And uh, not yet, but you will uh, get to know him uh, quite well, uh, Mr. Uh, John Baird, who has been Canada's former foreign minister. It's a pleasure having you here on the program for the first time. Great to be with you. Well, uh, we'll briefly start with prayer, if uh, you all are okay with it, and then uh, we'll dive into what you're doing here, what are the challenges that Israel is facing at this day and age uh, on the international stage also, uh, here uh, when we're talking about a regional element uh, from security perspectives. So uh, if you'll join me also from wherever you're watching right now at home. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to have such distinguished guests here with us at TV7 uh, Israel. We're praying for uh, your guidance and leading that any word that we say uh, will be uh, diverted to you, provide you glory, Father. And we ask for blessings to all of our viewers all over the world watching right now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, well, I uh, want to say y you have the, the team, but you also have a host. So how about we start with General Kupilvasu, uh, who currently hosts you here in Jerusalem. General? Well, thank you for, for having me. And uh, this was a great opportunity to host here this delegation of coming from the Friends of Israel Initiative. Uh, the idea is to let people have an opportunity to learn about the perspective of Israel, about the threats and the opportunities it faces today. We had uh, meetings with the Prime Minister and uh, with the Speaker of the Parliament and uh, with others from the security services that uh, briefed us about the situation. And of course, uh, it's imp highly important, critically important, for people to understand the context and uh, you have to provide the context for people to speak about the situation in the Middle East. And the, that's being done extremely well by the people uh, joining me here in the studio and, and the delegation. I think what we learned is that uh, first on the agenda for the government, the new government, is to tackle the threat coming from Iran. That's the most important thing. And uh, the fact that uh, the Iranians are now joining hands with the Russians in Ukraine and uh, keep uh, suppressing the uh, protests in, uh, in Iran people that are trying to change the situation, the poor situation they live in. And on top of all of that, uh, the ongoing effort of the Iranians to acquire enough material to have, a, in the first stage, a small arsenal, and later on, a bigger arsenal of nuclear weapons, this is something that uh, is number one on our agenda. At the same time, we have to tackle the two other main challenges. One is coming from the Palestinian uh, arena, uh, we are in the midst of a wave of terror and uh, we have to find ways to calm down the situation and look for better results. In this respect, much uh, is being done in the context of opening up more uh, the Abraham Accords for more countries to join in, hoping that this will send a message to the Palestinians, time is up for you to change the way you look at the situation, understand that uh, you need to move towards peace instead of trying to throw the Jews to the sea. That's, uh, that uh, is uh, something that is um, very high on the agenda of the government. And there's a big hope that we shall see some progress and uh, there will be movement, 
hopefully with Saudi Arabia, maybe with others, that's, uh, this is very important. And finally, there was the, the issue that is used against Israel in a very strange manner, which is the internal developments in, in Israel and the, the reform in the judicial system that uh, is being used in order to uh, portray Israel as a non-democratic state, which is actual nonsense, and uh, something has to be done in order to explain what is really an, at stake and what is the what is the issue. And uh, I think this was very important for the uh, delegation to learn from the people we met. With. Not only nonsense, General, but I think it's outrageous that it's being cynically used by various individuals here in Israel, uh, particularly from the uh, left and, and uh, liberal left, uh, in that context, in order to try and demonize Israel and then influence that demonization in order to try and influence the government's decision making, which uh, is something that uh, there was a prime minister uh, who uh, you're, of course, familiar with personally, uh, who, who was very critical of the, the uh, opposition and, and so on and so forth. He went and became in the opposition flew abroad and he was very critical of the government, but suddenly he started praising the government abroad. They asked him, what are you doing? Uh, in, in Hebrew, they asked him. He said, well, in Israel, I'm the biggest opponent of the government. Abroad, I'm the best friend of the government because it represents me and the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. And that is something that has been lost for too long, unfortunately. Uh, I'd like to move to you, Dr. Barrahi. Of course, uh, everybody is familiar uh, by now with uh, what you're doing. Uh, well with a glimpse of what you're doing uh, with regard to uh, the Friends of Israel initiative. How were you received? What are the key topics that currently you're taking out of it? Well, let me start by saying that this is the year which uh, it is 40 years since my first visit to Israel. I'm so glad we keep, we keep coming and, and learning no, about the country and the development inside, around, and outside Israel. I have to say that I'm a little bit concerned because I believe that when Israel is strong, the Western civilization is stronger and our enemies are weaker. When the debates, internal and domestic debates, are presented in such a way that are undermining the democratic value of, the, of Israel, the enemies of Israel all around the world will feel strengthened and emboldened. And that's one of our concerns, I think. No, you can debate whatever you want as any democracy, but in a way, and in a fashion, that doesn't undermine yourself. And I think, as you mentioned, some forces internal in Israel, whether conscious or unconscious, are really encouraging the enemies of Israel to be stronger and to increase the demonization and the delegitimation of Israel, which is a democracy as any other in the world. No? Uh, secondly, I think we are reaching a point where the external threats are mounting again. Uh, that's why we need a strong government in Jerusalem. Uh, strong enough to send a signal that uh, Israel will not allow any enemy to take advantage of any situation in the short term. I'm referring particularly to Iran. Uh, and another concern, as uh, General Kuperwasser mentioned, is the situation in the in the in Judea and Samaria. Uh, we, we perceive the Palestinian Authority weaker and weaker, and, and that may contribute to some chaotic situation and an explosion of new wave of violence, and I think that should be addressed also by the international community as soon as possible. That is something that I'd like actually to ask Mr. Baird. When you come here and you hear the various uh, updates from uh, officials, also particularly with uh, regard to uh, the West Bank districts of Judea, Samaria, the Jordan Valley, what do you take uh, from it? Because uh, there is currently a ongoing um, EU initiated, uh, the EU COP, which is of course mandated by the United Nations to train the security, uh, Palestinian Authority security forces. Canada is one of the biggest contingents thereof. And just a year ago, uh, I remember they uh, celebrated a decade of uh, pushing this forward. And I asked uh, the, the one of the individuals who happened to be a Canadian uh, how do you feel about being here a decade? Uh, and she said, ironically, well, it, it means we failed because apparently we still need to train them. You know, is this a sense of being able to contribute more to stabilize in a certain fashion the, the situation here? 
uh, in a different manner that has been taking place up until now uh, to turn more towards Israel maybe for countries like Canada and, and other countries that have been quite critical in recent years. I know you haven't been. Not at all. And you were quite uh, an exception, unfortunately. Um, but yeah. Let me tell you this. Uh, we strongly uh, support trying to increase the capacity of the Palestinian Authority to be able to uh, to keep the uh, the West Bank safe. Uh, through, for many, many years through Operation Proteus, we've uh, helped with uh, police training to give them the capacity to, to hopefully at some point uh, be able to deal with the security situation. But I think the reality is uh, they're falling short. Uh, as we've seen in both Janine and in Jericho, uh, they've lacked the capacity to be able to confront uh, terrorism and leaving no other alternative but uh, for uh, Israel to have to uh, to come in to ensure the uh, the safety and security of the uh, of the people of Israel. And, and I think that's unfortunate. It's more not just ten years. Uh, Operation Proteus began long before that, right. and uh, you know it's uh, it's a deep concern that they uh, have not been able to uh, to fully uh, you know deal with the security situation, which is inherently why uh, through all these peace negotiations uh, since uh, Oslo, uh, the uh, government of Israel and the people of Israel no, need a security presence uh, in the West. Bank to be able to to keep the people of uh, uh, of Israel safe, uh, so it's uh, it's fallen short. We're here though, and I think as uh, Zionists, as people who want to uh, promote Israel, particularly intervening strategically when it's under attack, uh, when it's uh, an effort of, uh, of people to delegitimize it, to be uh, well educated and informed, so we can do a, a better job on that. Uh, we learned a lot about obviously the security situation, particularly with respect to Iran, uh, which uh, continues to be. Uh, the biggest threat to international peace and security, not just for Israel, uh, but for the Sunni Arab Gulf states and, frankly, for civilized people everywhere. Uh, we're obviously concerned about uh, growing terrorist cells, not just, uh, frankly, in Gaza, but also in uh, in uh, the West Bank, uh, particularly when you hear, uh, you know, uh, United Nations facilities, schools being used as armed deep, the basements being used as armed depots, uh, and people acting with impunity, with no criticism whatsoever uh, for most of the democratic world, let alone uh, on the floor of the United Nations uh, Security Council or General Assembly, and we're also here to, you know, to learn about what's going on uh, with uh, the new government. And uh, you know, listen, I was a partisan uh, politician for uh, for many years. We were briefed in great detail about some of the uh, uh, legal and judicial reforms. And, uh, and with great respect, I think some are using, uh, are saying the sky is falling, that's the end of the world, it's the end of democracy. Uh, the proposals that, the, that are before uh, that are before the Knesset, which which most likelihood will change, uh, seem uh, nothing, no, nowhere near the end of democracy. Uh, frankly, uh, the system is uh, is far tougher uh, in Canada, which is seen as generally being fairly democratic and fairly open. You can appoint a Supreme Court judge with basically five signatures, uh, uh, even in a government that uh, only got 32%, 33% of the vote, popular vote, uh, let alone to have it go to a nine-person uh, uh, committee. Uh, it's very done very narrowly, so the proposals here, uh, people can, it's fair to agree with them, it's fair to disagree with them, but let's keep the, the political rhetoric down because I, I am concerned that it's going to be used uh, and uh, people are going to be gal the anti-Israel uh, and delegitimization crowd, whether it's in Europe or North America, is going to try to jump on this, and uh, that's not helpful for any uh, for anyone. Not for Israel, not for the Israeli people, but not for uh, those of us who are friends of Israel who uh, who are advocating around the world uh, on its behalf. Indeed, absolutely, Mr. Soini. Yeah, you, it's good to have you here from Finland. Of course, uh, you're a great friend, uh, not only of myself but also of TV7, and uh, I'd like to hear your perspective as uh, somebody who's been. Uh, the top diplomat for Helsinki for quite some time um, and have also been a good friend of Israel for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, first of all, it's a great opportunity to be here uh, as, a, uh, as a visitor and as a friend. And it is the second time with me with uh, this Friends of Israel initiative. And it, uh, it combines very nice way the experience I had uh, as a minister, as a, as a chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, and now as we have this NGO, uh, and the combine the different viewpoints uh, to come, come here and, and have a look. And I'm, uh, and my first concern is that uh, Israel, the state of Israel, is pressed to be an anti-democratic and um, apartheid state in many parts of the Europe. And this is a, a very, very dangerous concept. And, and we must challenge that. And, and now especially when uh, this juridical system, uh, which should be renewed, we must tell what it is 
all about. Because now they are, people and forces are trying to build bridges that this is something to do with Hungary or Poland or something like else. Uh, because those are not identical cases at all. And, and first of all, then uh, when there were elections held, and now the result was more clearer than in many times. So the country is uh, surely governable. You can actually govern the country. But many people don't like the uh, results of uh, election, which is the, the whole cornerstone of the democracy. And I, I think on, on these issues, we must be very stern throughout and say that Israeli people are capable and entitled to the government what they have elected. And that is the whole cornerstone of, uh, of Europe. But there are tendencies that uh, the election can uh, produce whatever result, but there are some other factors who would always dictate vote or something like that, what is right and what is wrong. But in democracy, uh, the vote of the people cannot be wrong. Indeed. Well, uh, you know... Uh, I'm not going to preach to the choir on this end, <laughs> but uh, you're absolutely right. At a time when we're looking at the situation, we see uh, particularly uh, with regard to the, you know, trying to liken Israel to Poland and Hungary, you know what? I wish. Yeah. I wish that we would find a, a closer understanding to the situation in Hungary in many levels from the political system because Hungary has been a champion when it comes to conservatism and allowing the people to speak their mind despite being under the umbrella of the European Union and subject to international treaties that have more weight to a certain degree in, in all EU's, uh, 27 EU member states than the member states themselves. So countries have lost their sovereignty under the European Union. And at this stage, a few countries, uh, it's, it's not easy. I mean, we see what's happening in Italy trying to push through. We are sitting, seeing the concessions that Poland ultimately is making uh, in yeah. light of uh, the European Union's legislator. We here in Israel are not under the umbrella of the European Union, nor are we under the umbrella of the United States. Uh, and therefore, when we decide to take certain legislative measures uh, in order to bring about uh, judicial reform, uh, some call it an overhaul. It's not an overhaul. Uh, people take it a few well, stages too far. One thing I've noticed yeah. here is that Israel, much like Canada and the United States, is deeply split politically. This is what's happened. This is what happens in dynamic democracies, uh, and uh, I think uh, the uh, in in all three countries, the rhetoric can get out a bit of hand uh, from time to time. And uh, I'm probably just as guilty of it in Canada. Uh, but Israel faces such extreme challenges with the the delegitimization crowd. Uh, we need to we need to be uh, mindful of that. Indeed, you'll see. It. A few words about the Iranian angle. What was the key point that was uh, brought forward in this trip? I think the major issue is that the need to uh, put more pressure on Iran and to clarify to Iran that uh, moving forward with their nuclear program is going to be costly for Iran. And uh, the way to do that, repeatedly what we heard, was that the need to clarify to Iran that there is a credible military option and that... Uh, strong sanctions are going to be taken against it if it moves, keeps moving towards the, this end. And uh, what we see today, unfortunately, is that uh, even though everybody speaks about the need to do something about Iran and uh, to stop the Iranians and so on and so forth, but in fact, very little is being done. Some acts are carried out in order to deliver the message that there is a, a credible military option. We saw the exercises, joint exercises between Israel and the United States that were really very uh, tremendous in size, uh, but uh, this is not enough. And uh, so far, I think the Iranians believe that uh, the, the arrangement they have today, in which they support the forces that fight against uh, the existing world order and the role of the United States in it, uh, and uh, suppress the resistance to their uh, regime, and uh, accumulate more and more uh, highly enriched uranium, and support the, uh, extreme terror groups around the Middle East uh, without any limitation. This is an, uh, an arrangement that can go on as long as they don't start enriching uranium to 90% and moving into uh, producing uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, this is a very dangerous situation. It should be clarified to the Iranians that uh, the world is not going to accept it. 
Although it's very difficult to deliver this message when you don't have a leadership from the United States stating this message to the Iranians. And uh, what we hear, even in these last few days, we hear it from the head of the IAEA, we hear it from Joseph uh, Borrell, uh, the head of the uh, foreign affairs uh, issues in the EU. And we hear it, uh, we hear an unclear sign from coming from the United States that the JCPOA is still open and uh, we would like to go back to the JCPOA, which is giving the Iranians everything they dream of uh, for free. And uh, this is very dangerous. And I think that uh, what needs to happen right now, and that's the message that the delegation had, was the need to put more pressure on Iran. Look, we isolated uh, the international community, isolated Russia and took severe measures. And Russia is not allowed to participate in the Olympics and uh, whatever. It's uh, Iran that does not less uh, harm than, uh, than Russia is, uh, is not isolated at all. So there's no reason for the Iranians to feel that there is any reason to change uh, the, their uh, behavior. Not only does Josep Borrell, uh, being the biggest proponent of this JCPOA, because of the fact, in my opinion at least, if he declares the JCPOA dead, he declares himself a failure, uh, which he's not willing to do like any other leader at that uh, matter. But uh, Dr. Bardahi, when we're talking about this, it's not only that they don't want to proclaim the JCPOA dead, they want to blame America, at least the EU high representative does, and he continues to blame America for the fact that the Iranians want to develop nuclear weapons. Uh, isn't this absurd, considering the fact that the Iranians wanted to develop those weapons far before the Trump administration ever came into existence? Yeah, as a matter of fact, is in the last year and a half where they have accelerated the the most of the development in the nuclear program, not under Trump. No? Uh, but we have to remind the people that um, the Ayatollahs and the Iranian regime is not seven feet foot tall. No? They are facing dramatic challenges internally now, seven or eight months of continuous demonstration against the regime for the first time in history. Uh, the economy is, is, is really uh, in deep trouble. Uh, and they are weak. They are not. They are not in the best position nowadays. So increasing sanctions and putting more political pressure and diplomatic pressure will will pay off. And uh, the problem is, as I think in the last two years, the, the new American administration, uh, whether they spend five days to shoot down a, a Chinese balloon over the airspace, is a, a, a disgrace. And uh, and um, but we need to convince the American because the, the Iranians fear any reaction coming from Washington. No? And, uh, and we need to convince the American administration that uh, a new GCPA is not the way to go, that we are in the moment to increase the sanctions and the pressure. And the Iranians may, you know, we are able to twist their arm, no? If we, if we are united uh, um, and we are clear and signaling to them that uh, if they go beyond 90% of the rich Iranian, uh, the game is totally different, and the military options are on the table. Yeah, as as bad as the nuclear program is, and it's a, it's abysmal. We need American leadership. If there is no American leadership, uh, uh, it's not going to be solved. Uh, we need to go after them for their atrocious human rights record, their support of Putin and his war against the Ukrainian people. We need to go after it for material support of terrorism, whether it's Hamas and Hezbollah uh, here in Israel, whether it's the Houthis, uh, whether it's the the, the 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 blood that's on their hands from uh, Assad's war in Syria. Uh, there are terrorist attacks in Iraq and virtually every part of the world. Uh, these are evil people which need to be confronted. The Iranian people don't support the mullahs, they don't support the IRGC, and they need direct, we need direct pressure, uh, not just from the West, but frankly, the Arab world is uh, equally as concerned as we are. Why yeah. is the Canadian government lagging behind when it comes to sanctions and, and everything to curtail these efforts? Well, we, when I was in government and Stephen Harper, Canada led the world. We uh, broke off diplomatic relations. We kicked every uh, Iranian uh, diplomat out of the country. Um, we uh, led the fight on human rights at the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, what there is, though, is this group that want to demonize anyone who wants to do regime change internally uh, and to uh, be apologists for the regime. Oh, we can't, uh, uh, we can't list the IRGC because some of these people are, um, uh, are conscripts. We need to put pressure on every single person in the IRGC Absolutely. to understand there are consequences. Uh, when they're sitting around the family dinner table, uh, they've got to explain to their family members why they're killing civilians. There are women and children that are out protesting. Uh, and uh, I think there's, uh, you know, we need strong leadership, not, uh, not, uh, not weak. Mr. Soli, yeah. just before uh, everything unraveled between uh, the fact that the Iranians and Russians are deepening cooperation yeah. when uh, we're talking about attacks in, in uh, Ukraine, uh, 
it seems like Mr. Havisto is not very vocal against the Iranians. Uh, no, and, and, and unfortunately so, because they are combined. Uh, uh, Iran is enabling uh, many things happening in Ukraine. It should be held accountable. It should be said in and out. And, uh, and the other thing is what should be said in and out. There will be significant spillover effect if Iran is going to get nuclear weapon. What about Turkey? What about Saudi Arabia? What about everybody else? This is a matter of utmost importance to hold the line and be sure that Iran is not going to get it. Absolutely. Dr. Barnaghi, what's up uh, next? Well, I think uh, we are still meeting people here uh, to understand better the situation and we'll keep an eye on developments and we will try to portray the correct image of of Israel across the world as we have been trying to do in the last 10 years and defend the interests of the state of Israel, the U.S. state, and the democratic, vibrant, dynamic society. Indeed. Well, uh, we have roughly one minute left, and I'd like to give you an opportunity to just, in one sentence, what is the outlook for 2023 from your perspective when you're talking about your country's relations with uh, the state of Israel? Where should it focus on? I need to, we think we need to focus on Iran and the threat that they pose Israel and the civilized world and the Sunni Arab Gulf states. We need to confront it. Mr. Sonny. We are going to have presidential elections and it should be very, very good to ask uh, east of the candidate what is the attitude. Uh, are you running? I, I may be persuaded. <laughs> <laughs> General Kupil, also. What we expect is the world to come together in a, an effort to stop Iran, really, with a credible threat and with real sanctions. The, the, what has been proven throughout history is that when they are facing a real threat, the real danger, they slow down and take As was clearly seen in 2003, indeed. Yes. We are reaching a point of taking a serious decision vis-à-vis Iran. And we need to come together to present a common front against it. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank Mr. Soini, Mr. Baird, General Kupilvas, uh, and Dr. Bardahi for being part of today's panel. And uh, uh, thank you all for being with us in today's program. And until next time, shalom. TV7 Israel invites you to watch and hear some of the most knowledgeable experts, most of whom are took in creating policies shaping this region today. Join us for Jerusalem Studio. For more of TV7's productions and editorials, we invite you to visit our website at www.tv7israelnews.com.